Hello Starlight! In today's video, I will be recreating a screen capture of everyone's favorite anime wizard boyfriend, Howl from Studio Ghibli's Howl's Moving Castle. In the YouTube community tab, I had asked you guys if you wanted me to paint blonde or dark haired Howl. And honestly, I think it was pretty much split down the middle. I personally love both uh, both versions, but I am a little bit partial to that iconic pink and purple jacket. So I did end up going with the blonde hair. But fear not, I did do a marker portrait of him in one of my Instagram live streams with the dark hair as well. So everybody wins in a way. <laughs> I often get asked why I always sketch with a colored pencil rather than a graphite pencil. And the reason for that is because I personally find that graphite smudges quite a bit, not only during the sketching process, but I also find it just poorly mixes with whatever medium I'm using on top of it, whether it be with watercolors or markers, etc. And in turn, it just makes the colors all grayed and muddy when it's mixing in with the graphite. So when I use color pencils to sketch with instead, I find that there's minimal smudging and even if it does, or if the sketch is still visible under the painting, I find that it complements the piece rather than takes away from it since it's uh, already a color to begin with. Which is the reason why I opt to use red most of the time because I typically paint portraits and I find that it mixes and works well with, uh, with skin tones, which is why I don't typically go for uh, something like a blue or a green. As always, um, the art supplies that I'm using will be listed in the description down below and Similar to my uh, previous screen cap illustrations videos, um, I'm going to be kind of intermittently talking about, um, you know, the movie or the, the character and uh, a little bit about the process. So if you're not interested in hearing me ramble or talk about these things, feel free to mute the video and put on your own music and just sit back and watch the painting. So something to note about sketching directly onto your watercolor paper is you want to try to sketch lightly with minimal pressure. That way it's easier to erase mistakes and you're not damaging the surface of the paper from over erasing as well as pressing um, the lead into the surface. That is also the reason why I choose to use a kneadable eraser so that um, I find it's just more gentle than a typical plastic or rubber eraser. Plus, I just hate dealing with eraser shavings in general, so needable erasers all the way. I would also love to apologize in advance. Um, later, you'll see some weird inconsistent lighting that occurs in some of the footage. Uh, well, more inconsistent than usual. Um, a couple of months ago, I rearranged my work area and I now have a standing desk under my window, which is great for that natural lighting, but unfortunately, when I was painting and filming this piece, the sun was going down and there was a lot of clouds passing by it, which is why the lighting keeps changing. Um, I really enjoyed this, how this piece turned out and I figured you guys would still want to see the process despite the, the weird lighting situation. So just thought I'd let you know in advance. <laughs> it's funny. Um, a lot of people ask me why I don't draw male characters or males in general more often. Uh, and back in high school, I used to draw male uh, characters all the time, whether it be fan art or non-fan art. And some something along the way, as I got older, I just lost interest and felt less and less inspired or compelled to draw men. I give a more extensive answer to this question in my Draw With Me Q&A video. Um, but anyways, recently, um, this six fan arts challenge started going around on Instagram. And so during my Instagram live streams, I've been drawing a lot of fan art for this challenge. And in my first round of characters, I drew Sokka from Avatar The Last Airbender. And I actually had so much fun. Um, so 
suddenly I'm just now on like a male fan art character kick and I'm just gonna keep rolling with it. Plus, uh, people's comments about how attractive they thought my version of Sokka was just killing me in the best way possible. <laughs> If you've seen my previous screen cap redraw video of Kiki from Kiki's Delivery Service, you will already know that I'm a huge Studio Ghibli fan. I have a really hard time definitively choosing one film to be my absolute favorite, but I think Howl's Moving Castle might be the one. Previous to seeing the film, I had never read uh, Diane uh, Wynne Jones's novel in which the film is based off of, but after a number of years of rewatching the film over and over, I finally decided to read the book out of curiosity. And I certainly wasn't disappointed. Well, except for the book cover. Oh my god, it is. I mean, apologies to whoever designed it, but I. It is ugly, guys. It's so outdated. I really wanted to get a version of this book that didn't have this cover, but it seemed to be the only one I could find at the time. So anyway, I digress. <laughs> but yeah, um, don't judge a book by its cover because this was very fun. It was a very like light read, of course, because it was intended for children. Um, and what I actually really loved was at the end of the book, there is an interview with the author discussing how she felt about Miyazaki's animated film adaption of her story. Um, I actually read the interview before I actually read the book. And uh, it turns out she is she was already a fan of Miyazaki's work and she really enjoyed the film. Uh, something that struck me was she had said that she felt the portrayal of Howell in the film was more of a hero and less of a drama queen. And I remember thinking, wait, he's less of a drama queen than he already is? And lo and behold, after reading the book, turns out Howell is an even bigger drama queen in the book than he was in the film, which I didn't think was possible, and it's hilarious. Of course, there are a number of other differences between the film and the book. Uh, the main thing being that the book obviously has more complexities and characters, um, which makes sense because with a film adaption, uh, it has to be more streamlined and concise. and. Something that really surprised me in the book that I wasn't expecting uh, was that Howl is basically an interdimensional travel traveler of sorts. <laughs> and there's, uh, there's a glimpse into this life that he has in our modern day real world. Uh, this, this thread in the, in the book, I'm, I'm actually glad it wasn't included in the film because I feel like it would have really taken away from the, the whimsy and the charm of the world that's built in the movie, which is what makes it so fantastical and makes it so uniquely uh, a Ghibli film. An element that was in the book that I do wish was included in the film though, uh, was that book Sophie is shown to have much more obvious magical capabilities. There's, uh, there's this running gag throughout the book where she continues to repair Howell's jackets, uh, but she unknowingly is putting charms on them. And I think the inclusion of some of those scenes would have been really, really fun to see in the film. It would have kind of reinforced the kind of bickering dynamic between Sophie and Howell that is, uh, that is so beloved. An addition that I really love in the film, though, is that uh, Sophie is seen growing younger at certain points in the film and then, of course, eventually breaks, this, breaks the curse altogether, which um, the kind of the appearance of getting younger and older back and forth is not included in the book from what I remember. Um, and yeah, I've, I've seen this movie many, many times and I always wondered what exactly it was that was triggering her kind of de-aging. And I think that it happens when she has let go of any of her insecurities and when she's in moments of feeling really confident and sure of herself, that's when the curse is kind of momentary lifted, which is, uh, you know, by the end of the movie, she's kind of reached her character arc and the cur the curse is completely gone because she's, you know kind of found herself I guess um, and I think that's such a lovely like subtle kind of character um, choice that they that they did for the movie 
And also, I love that she actually ends up keeping her silver hair at the end of the movie, which doesn't happen in the book. So I think the silver hair is just, it's so pretty. Oh, and of course, the, the amazing designs of all the characters in the film. Uh, I cannot imagine the characters any other way, even, even reading the book. And especially Calcifer, who is so freaking cute in the movie, but is complete, like completely differently described in the book. Um, he's like a blue demon, which I was like, oh. <laughs> uh, but yeah, another thing that really threw me off was um, Howell's assistant slash apprentice. In the movie, the character is named Markle, which I always thought was like a weird name, but I didn't really question it. And then I started reading the book and the characters, the character himself is like much different, but uh, his name is Michael. And after some thought, I realized, wait, was there some kind of funny translation mistake that occurred? Cause I was wondering like in the Japanese version, maybe whenever someone tried to pronounce Michael, it just sounded like Markle because of the accent or something. And then maybe when it got translated back to English for the subtitles in the dub, they assumed it was Markle and not Michael. <laughs> I don't know. This is just like total speculation on my part, but I thought it was like a, an amusing theory that I'd share with you guys. <laughs> I had posted this finished piece on my Instagram earlier in the week and I had asked my followers to let me know what their favorite scene was from the movie. And the first scene that was mentioned and is always the one that comes to my mind um, when I'm thinking about the movie is when Howell has that colossal meltdown about his hair color and he says, uh, what is the point in living if I cannot be beautiful? which <laughs> just perfectly captures his character's ultra drama queen essence. But, uh, and then immediately after Sophie remarks back, I've never been beautiful my entire life. And oh, I remembered when I first saw that scene, that line really hit me as someone who was always really insecure, especially about my physical appearance. Oh my goodness. It was just, it was so heartbreaking and so relatable. And another, th another scene that someone had mentioned was when Howell and Sophie are in the garden and he says to her, uh, Sophie, Sophie, you're beautiful. Oh my God. Just when I was reminded of that scene, it just pulls at my heartstrings. Oh, so good. And then another scene that uh, I also love that someone mentioned was when they first meet and they're walking on air over the town. It is so charming and whimsical and it's classic Miyazaki because he always wants to have some kind of floating, flying scene. And quite honestly, it puts any first encounter I'll, ha I'll ever have with a man to shame. Howell has set the standard too high. <laughs> Which honestly, I think that's probably why so many people have has done fan art of him for this uh, six fan arts challenge, because how could you not? He is a darling. <laughs> anyway, I, uh, I just realized I haven't really even talked about the actual process of this painting, but it's really nothing new if you've seen my previous watercolor illustration videos. I, I find doing these screenshot redraws just so relaxing and although I did put a little bit of pressure on myself because I wanted to make sure I did Howell's beauty justice, I actually found the painting process for this just it felt like autopilot almost because there is a clear ref a reference that I'm working from and I wasn't really challenging myself or going out of my comfort zone or anything like that. And while of course doing those things are, are good and important to push in, uh, to push yourself and grow as an artist, sometimes it's just, it's nice to just paint for the sake of it and have a good time with it, which I think is why um, I really enjoy doing these videos because it just, it just sort of gives me kind of breathing room to do something a bit more uh, casual, which is nice because it doesn't require as much uh, brain power, basically. <laughs> 
So for those of you who are not familiar with Howl's Moving Castle, uh, I hope that if you made it to this far into the video that it was at least somewhat entertaining and maybe will interest you in reading the book or watching the film. Uh, I definitely encourage it because it's a fantastic story and the characters are so fun. Um, and for those of you who have seen the movie or read the book or both, uh, I hope that um, this discussion was interesting and um, I would love to know uh, what your favorite scene is from the movie because um, I, I just love I love uh, discussing with you guys about um, you know movies and characters and stuff. It's it's like one of my favorite things right now. <laughs> And uh, yeah, I, I really enjoy doing these uh, screenshot redraws. So uh, let me know in the comments what um, character or movie TV show um, you'd love to see me recreate next because, you know, I really have fun doing these. So um, I hope you guys are all staying safe and healthy. And I hope that, um, you know, my videos are able to serve as a little bit of escape, some, you know, some light in these dark and weird, crazy times. And yeah, I'm aiming to have a video out every Friday. So I will hopefully see you next Friday. Have a good one. Bye.